you can just that comment will come back in with the event log, with the error log as well. So you can set that to be extra you like. Uh, and then lastly, the bottom one again is to replace debug.write line. So that will naturally output everything to debug if you don't pass any other level info that you want to use. Um, then we have the feedback prompt. This is just a, something which I've written myself for in my main page. You can do it in your app startup. The intention of that is just to quite literally say, okay, we measure um, if the logger has a critical log. There's a little method to do that. It just quickly looks through the uh, XML file and says, is that critical? Yes, we crashed. We need to generate something. And all you can do is an app.logger.email report and then clear events from log. And that's it. It'll generate the report for you. And it, you'll send up any parameters, and I'll show you parameters in a second. Uh, and that email report can then be sent back to whichever support address you specified. So it's simple. It's really easy. It's not going to tell you um, metrics at the moment. Uh, that's kind of what 43 degrees is sort of working on. He's going to do a, a contract so that you can upload it to any server and place that you like. And then you can start doing analysis on it if you're interested. Um, but ultimately, the whole of the whole point behind it was I was fed up with the fact that I had to keep writing the same code over my two apps, so I just wanted to create something that could be dropped into any app, change the namespace, and you're ready to go. So this is what you get back. Uh, I apologize for the low resolution on the screen. Like the bottom is a bit un unclear, but you get the date, the time, the level, so debug, and exactly what the event was. A stat trace would appear under there as well if the stat trace existed. And then this is kind of thing you get back an email. And uh, I'm actually going to say already so you can see this one. This is unfortunately is a nice big plug that I released with version 2.2 of our app. Um, the notifications currently, every time you tap on them, the thing crashes. Whoops. <laughs> there's, a really, there's an update out there, but uh, it turns out there was a bit of a cross thread which I missed, and uh, that basically crashed the app. Despite the fact that it launches absolutely fine when you go into the, the article viewer normally, testing is a pain in the ass. <laughs> so what, you, what we get back is, a little bit of information, which is the parameter dictionary, and the other thing about the logger is that you can set any parameter you like. It's just a, an ID dictionary. Uh, you can set something and just keep it stored. That will persist through the entire time, and it will let you capture things like the version. Uh, I've also written a method in there which does convert the entire uh, isolated storage section. So if you use settings in there, it converts it into that dictionary. The intention being that way, I use it to find out the last news that someone read, uh, what their settings are, and um, if they specify that they want to. Um, so you can just run that method and it will convert everything that was stored in the isolated storage that isn't a file uh, into that parameter dictionary. Great way of collecting information. And in fact, if you want to see that in action, you can download the app and just toggle on the info collection, send, go send an email, and you'll see all these things appear. Um, and it's actually helped me fix that bug before then. With, without the clogger, as I call it, it's the clogger. And I don't know why, I just like that. Um, without the clogger, I wouldn't have found this parameter is incorrect bug because it always initially logs without a stat trace, and that's the one that gets captured. And um, with the clogger, it captured all four, and I got to see what the stat trace was and trace it back eventually. Um, although man, is it difficult. So that's the WPC logger, and I encourage you to go and contribute or try it out. Now we're going to talk about Windows 10 Central. Um, I've sort of become enamoured with the site without even realising it, and it's now something that I get quite involved in. Uh, and for the more advanced developers in the room, and uh, Ray, sorry, because we're going to be competing now. Um, all about Windows Phone over there as well. I'm not going to talk about other competition. Um, for the advanced developers in the room, this is where we want to help you. Uh, so, how can we help? First thing is we do app reviews all the time. Um, we have a great effect, which I'm going to show you later on, on to put people who uh, submit to our app, uh, sorry, submit to our site. Um, people will, because our app obviously has the download app built straight in, if you show off your app on our website, People will find it on their application, read about it, swipe over and download it in about two clicks, uh, or two taps rather. So it's a really good way of getting some, getting some uh, knowledge out there, getting people to be interested in your application. The other way we're interested in helping is we have our developer spotlights in the forums. Uh, if you're looking for beta testers because you're better at me than running through test modules, uh, then that's the way to do it. There's always people who want to try out new apps, especially seeing as betas are free, and we want people to love free things. Um, we also have, obviously, sections where you have a little chat with the people. Um, that's not going to replace the, the app hubs uh, forums as it is when it comes to real development resources, but it's a great place to find those testers and some of the things that I use it for. And the podcast. Um, you probably be unfortunately bored listening to my voice if you listen to the podcast, I apologise for that. Um, but we are interested in getting people on who want to talk about their app a bit more. And the reason we want to do that is because whilst reviews are great, they're impersonal, uh, and a way to get a really good following for your application is to come on a podcast and tell us a little bit about the project and the person behind it, how long it's taken you to do it. Uh, we get about, we don't get a lot of huge people on our podcast, we get about 500 live listeners every time we do it, uh, and something in the region of, I think it is thousands of something downloads per week. 
so if you want someone to be invested in you as a developer and you as a project, that's a great way to do it. Um, we gave a shout out to Pepper because we love your app uh, on the uh, last podcast. Um, and that went over really well. I think you can feature it a couple times in the marketplace. That was probably your doing rather than ours. Oh, that was a oh, Thank you very much. So yeah, there we go. That is a great guy, by the way. So, say, okay. um, so we want to get people involved in the podcast. And if you're interested in doing that, come and speak to me. Because uh, unfortunately, I script the whole thing and, and basically decide what's happening. Uh, so come and say hi to me, and I will figure out either a 10-minute. If you don't want to do it live, we can record it, and then we'll just play it out during the podcast. But we're really interested in getting developers on board. Um, and this is the WP Central effect. Um, Matt, one of our site submitters, uh, has a profound app. Uh, and can anyone tell me where they think, when they think the application was featured? <laughs> Go on, I challenge you. It's the hardest question I've asked the entire time. But, uh, the, the bottom line represents the number of users. He basically gained 2,000 users in a day, uh, pretty much, well, a couple of days, uh, the number of active sessions, so people were actually coming back to the app. Um, and on a much smaller scale, when Rate Your Beer was uh, featured, it's nowhere near as popular an app, but uh, it doubled my user base just from having it there for one day. So it really makes a difference to get these things featured and we want to know about them. Obviously you telling us helps us and uh, us telling our readers helps you and helps our readers. So everyone's a winner. Uh, yeah, and we're also covering this event, which is about there. Come and say hi. Uh, come and show us your apps. We're, gonna, we're interested. We're going to be writing up all these things where we find something useful. Um, and we do want you to come and engage with us because it helps our site. It helps you guys out. It's really good for everybody. Questions? That is everything I have to say. So is anyone got anything they want to ask? Yes. Yeah, really good presentation. Thank you. That. It wasn't a presentation, it was a talk. It was a talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really um, but my company calls it death by PowerPoint otherwise. <laughs> so I'm to do it. No, it's good. Uh, just on the um, the isolated storage, so you put the storing the settings, storing the settings within there. Probably other people know how to do this, but when you uh, release a new version of the app and people mm -hmm. download it, how do you keep those settings within the isolated storage? So are we talking about with the clogger or with just in general? Sorry, the, well, the, the other uh, the WP Central, I think you've got settings yeah. there. So, uh, so uh, the settings, the settings persist uh, even if someone upgrades. Okay. So your isolated storage stays there. You can just add things to that settings dictionary. It's the easiest way to store things. Okay. It does occasionally, thanks to a wonderful bug that only seems to happen in Samsung devices, get completely wiped out. Right. I don't know why that happens. Does that happen on occasional Nokia as well? I have no idea why that is. I thought it was a, it was a space issue, but the last guy who who sent me a help request had 11 gig free, so it can't be that. Joe just made my That'll do. It's, uh, it's, it's all there for. Um, so basically, the way you just do it is you let that persist, and Give yourself an update. basically store in that as well, the app version. Do a quick check every time somebody does a load up, does it equal the old version? Right. And then have yourself an upgrading schedule. Okay. Um, because I shot myself in the foot when I tried to release the beta version of something which wasn't compatible with an old specification. And I only realized it when I put the beta out. It was a beta, it's fine. Um, have yourself an upgrading script, just even if you clear out your old memory because you need to. Sure. That's the best way to go back. In my opinion, if someone else has got a better way of doing it, I would love to hear it because I'm still learning the other day. Yeah, yeah, so I'm just worried if we've had a you know, high school board or something. And yeah, they, they that should like, persist, yeah. as will files that you store in the asset storage as well, okay. uh, unless you specifically set not to. So, for example, uh, when you load up the WP Central, there's always something there. Uh, we store a little XML cache file uh, in the background. Sure. That gets wiped out intentionally now when you upgrade, uh, because otherwise sometimes it can be cool. um, <laughs> Normally, it's a really great way of having an instant response, and the perception of speed is what's most important, not the app speed. Yeah. It's just as long as something's there when you launch it, people feel happy. Okay, great. Anybody else? Yeah, just one thing on the list box stuff. Um, we don't use it at all. No. We've gone to the items panels. Really? Yeah. yeah. Because Was it scroll view around there or something? Yeah, yeah. scroll view around there. Do you know what? I tried this out. How much still content, sort of content have you got in one area? Because it, well, it, it takes, it's got to load every single image to do that. With the list box, it will load images as they appear. Whereas with the scroll viewer, everything has to load at once. It's, it's some of our structures of the items are quite complex, and mm -hmm. we don't put them all on the screen at one time. But one of the big problems I found with the list box is that if you scroll down a bit, you don't have way. When you then test back, it's the list box then is all funny as it's sort of decompilates and then it just goes back down and things like that. So it's kind of, we just see it that way, and we don't get the scroll. Do you, do you have images in, those, in that scroll view? You do. And are they retrieved from the, from the web or are they stored in the app? Stored in the app. And they're stored locally, that's a great way of doing it. Because I tried this myself, I tried to just putting everything inside the scroll viewer and then wrapping it in like, the grid or some stat pan or something along those lines. And it's great because the scrolling works perfectly, as you said, and the scroll viewer is a really good control. 
The problem is that it has to load everything visually, including all images, before it will render. Uh, so, should be a bit of an inside that I reckon it's possible. At the time, I was really tired. We also, I also found that the list, the list box always given us suspected items and sometimes that's a bit of pain in the ass. Yes, yeah, thankfully I don't use those. Um, I did a little cheeky hack and put the uh, index in the tab instead. And that way we can just pull it out of the cache that's already modeled. Um, that's actually quite a good point. If you're modeling things, um, if, you have, if you have to load something when, you, when they're tapping from the internet again, you might be doing it the wrong way. If it's at all possible for you to use something that you've already prefetched, it seems much quicker even if you have to enrich it afterwards. So the comments, for example, get fetched later on. But when you tap into an article, that's loading out of an already cached view. Uh, so that's a really good point. Anybody else? Good. Where's the beer? Huh? Where's the beer? Where's the beer? <laughs> <laughs> it's in the Marcus. It's in the Marcus of those beers. Um, that's just a very good point. I don't think Singer's been uploaded yet, so if anybody wants to be the first one to upload Singer beer, um, that'd be great. Personally, it's a sort of three and a half star for me. We don't do half stars. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, you just on the point of isolated storage, actually. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's perfectly fine for certain types of apps where you're not going to be, like, if you've got a game and it's got many yeah. levels, you're not going to be playing that over a two year period. But I think as a developer, I've started to consider the fact that most people keep their phones between, say, actually, 18 actually. months to three years. And yes. if it's an app that they're constantly using, then you yeah. have to consider actually uploading your settings to a remote server just so that when you change phones, actually, the user doesn't lose that, um, the, the, those mm -hmm. settings. Um, and, you might argue that settings are a very no, small agree. aspect of it, but it's, it all adds to the... Um, I absolutely agree, I think that's a really good idea. And uh, if I had control over the server code for Windows Phone Central, I'd probably do the same, um, but I don't. Uh, so if you, that's a really good point. If you do want to give an option for someone to back up to the cloud or integrate with SkyDrive, a lot of developers are doing right now.